Before I introduce uh, Ambassador Mitchell, uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, I'm sure you all are aware that um, we have a sold out talk this Thursday um, with uh, former Chief Executive CY Leon uh, coming to speak at the club. Um, even though it is sold out, we will be live streaming that event, so uh, you can check on the website or the YouTube page. And um, for all media who are looking to attend that as well, um, please be sure to register at, at the front desk. Um, and we also live streaming today's uh, today's event. So uh, I have the honor to introduce. Oh, firstly, I'm Shivani Utani. I'm uh, on the uh, board of governors uh, at FCC. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, and I have the pleasure to introduce Ambassador Derek Mitchell, uh, who will be our guest speaker today. Uh, he is the president of the National Democratic Institute, a nonpartisan NGO that works to support and strengthen democratic institutions worldwide. Uh, he just uh, came from a trip that uh, involved Nepal and, and Burma. Uh, Burma was obviously where he was ambassador from 2012 to 2016, the first U.S. ambassador to serve in that role for 22 years. Uh, and prior to that, he was um, essentially the number two on Asia policy at the Pentagon uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I invite Ambassador Schultz to speak. Thank you. I assume I can close this. <laughs> nope, it goes on. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Shivani, for, for the introduction. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming out and for hosting me here. Uh, it's particularly a great pleasure to see so many good friends. Professor Zwei, who taught me everything I know. He probably doesn't want people to know this, but everything I need to know about China. Professor? Okay. Everything uh, that I, I know about China in grad school about 30 years ago, so it's great to see you here. My friends, the Heinz, the CG, my wife from uh, Redmond, Andy, and, and Jane, it's so great to see you. Um, sounds like I'm doing great, maybe not. Um, yeah, a lot. Um, I all want to thank, of course, the Foreign Correspondence Club uh, for, for bringing me here today. It's a legendary institution. Uh, for over 70 years, this club has stood as not only a locus, but also a symbol of the Hong Kong people's long-standing commitment to free expression, a free press, open debate, and the search for truth, all cornerstones of a free democratic society. Your mission of supporting journalism and public discourse here in Hong Kong remains more important than ever. Uh, I applaud you all for your continued work. We didn't rehearse this, so we'll play it as we go. We have to brand ourselves. Maybe I'd go up there. I know who I am. There we go. Okay. Um, and right off the bat, uh, let me offer my congratulations to uh, the people of Hong Kong. Um, it is the elephant in the room, what happened just a few days ago, uh, for peacefully completing the district level elections. Um, the astounding 70 plus uh, turnout. Puts even established democracies to shame. We were talking about this uh, in the other room. It puts established democracies like the United States to shame. We would dream of having 70% turnout for any election, let alone a, a local election. And the results speak for themselves, uh, rather loudly and clearly, I should say. I'm sure we'll have a chance to uh, talk more about this in the discussion that follows. Uh, but Hong Kongers of all stripes should be proud of what occurred, whatever the results. And once again, puts you in the global spotlight for all the right reasons and earn the admiration of citizens all over the world. Congratulations again. Now, I am at the tail end of a 10-day trip to Asia. My first is NDI president. I was two days last week in Nepal and then five days in back in my old haunts in Myanmar. Uh, there are some interesting general similarities I detected in both. They are both very tremendously diverse, underdeveloped, multi-ethnic countries seeking to emerge from brutal internal conflict into a new era of peace, development, and democratic federalism. Uh, but I think we'll have a chance perhaps to talk a little bit more in detail about those places um, in the, in the Q&A. They certainly diverge in some serious ways, but it was a pleasure to go to those two places which are struggling as well for democratic development in Asia. Now, I'd really like to start with an introduction. I think the, maybe the subtext of this uh, talk is NDI the supposed black hand? Uh, so, 
Let me start with a few words about the organization that I lead. What is NBI? Who are we? Where do we come from? What do we do? The National Democratic Institute, or NBI, as you see up there, was founded 36 years ago in 1983. Um, we are affiliated with the Democratic Party of the United States, but not formally connected to the party. We have a separate board of directors led by our chairman, who is the former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright. Um, we are nonpartisan, a non-governmental organization based in Washington, D.C., whose mission is to support those working to build and sustain the nuts and bolts of democratic practice in their countries all around the world. We receive about 50% uh, of our funding from USAID through program grants. We get about 20 to 25% of our funding from the National Endowment for Democracy through, again, grants. Uh, we get also other funding from the State Department, uh, but also from uh, international foundations like uh, the British government, the Canadian government, uh, from the Norwegian, Swiss, others all around the world, as well as getting some support from private funders. Um, this means that we not only assist the development of political parties, legislatures, civil society organizations, and other dem democratic institutions and help them do their work, but also facilitate their interaction with one another and with the public to ensure that democracy delivers credible elections, thoughtful and responsive policy making, and ultimately stable and prosperous societies. In the work that we do, we do not pick sides. We work with all equally, with partners across the political spectrum, as long as they accept the basic tenets of peaceful political contest. We are interested in process, not outcomes. We work transparently. We do not advocate for specific policies, aside from those that directly support the principles of a fair democratic process. And those include transparency, accountability, and inclusion of all equally. Neither, I might add, is there a charter to export the so-called American model, which is, I think, a common misperception. We're out there saying, look at America, we do it like we do. Um, in the work we do, we instead share a variety of democratic models and experiences. Uh, from around the world to allow countries to learn lessons and decide for themselves which suits them best, which is right for their individual context. The American model is one of many. We share a bunch for those to choose, others to choose for themselves. And to assist us over the past three decades, we have built an extensive global network of democratic practitioners that we tap into on a regular basis. And that network grows by the day. It is work we at NDI are proud and rather humble to be part, take part in, and one we feel is more needed than ever around the world given the state of democracy, which I'll, I'll talk to in just a moment. Uh, I'll talk to you just now. Um, just a few weeks back, I was, um, the world took note of the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. I was in Berlin myself for a couple days, along with uh, Madeleine Albright, to commemorate that anniversary. The tenor of the conversations at that time was quite consistent probably were engaged in if you're thinking about it yourselves. 30 years ago, and in the decade that followed, the future of democracy seemed bright. History had ended. Democracy had triumphed. The tide was coming in. The tide that was washing over Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America alike. There was a whiff of inevitability, even triumphalism, about the spread of democracy around the world, even if many believed the process would take time perhaps generations, to take hold. Thirty years later, though, most bemoan that challenges to democracy worldwide seem severe and on the ascendant. Democracy, according to various surveys, had regre has regressed each year for more than a decade, not just in newer democracies, but in lesser, uh, in, in lesser developed democracies, but even in established democracies with developed economies, apparently including my own, at least that's what I hear. Um, these challenges are exacerbated by a number of factors. New digital technologies that allow spoilers to sow division and disinformation more quickly, widely, and effectively than ever before. The emergence of demagogues who prey on insecurity, fear, and racial or religious division to gradually subvert democracy in fact, even if they often retain it in form. The rise of assertive autocratic states that consider democracy a direct challenge to their interests, and the failure in too many places of democracy to deliver tangible benefits for people to 
meet their minimal expectations. As a result of these factors, we see in many different countries and many different permutations, confident assumptions of democratic inevitability have dissipated. Instead, fatalism has set in among some, and autocratic leaders now appear to be more confident, even asserting that liberalism is obsolete and tout their authoritarian models as preferable to democracy. But if democracy's advocates were prematurely triumphant 30 years ago, I would venture the same for those declaring the inevitable triumph of illiberalism today. For while democracies, no doubt, are undergoing stress, democracies are not uniquely subject to the growing political dissatisfaction that we see around the world. From Moscow to Managua, Khartoum to Cairo, Bolivia to Beirut, to Tehran and Algiers to right here in Hong Kong and beyond. Citizens are taking to the streets in frustration to demand that their voices be heard and that their government protect their rights and corruption and open their political system. Even in those spots where former democratic success stories had famously regressed or are famously regressing, places like Turkey, Hungary, and Poland, recent elections suggest that systematically chipping away at democratic institutions and appeals to xenophobia may have their limit. What else can we learn from a record of the past 30 years and the unrest that we are witnessing today? First, as if those of us who live in democracies don't know this already, democracy is not easy. It's messy, it's complicated, it's imperfect, even if it is the best option available. We've learned that while one can assist a country to, to develop basic democratic institutions in democratic processes, which is what NBI has been doing. Changing mindsets and building a new democratic culture is much harder and takes much longer. And progress will not move in a straight line. We've learned to from the need to manage expectations, our own and others, about democracy's ability to take root and deliver public goods quickly, particularly where underdevelopment exists and civic trust is low. We've also learned that identity politics is powerful. But economic dislocation combined with demagogic appeals can lead to electoral victory, at least in the short run. We've also learned that the same old guys, and they tend to be guys, insist on playing the same old game despite the presence of a few new rules. It's likely you're going to get the same old result over time. It is therefore important for achieving a different result that democratic systems open themselves up to new voices young people, women, and traditionally marginalized communities if they are to remain or become vital. It is instructive that even as surveys suggest faith in political institutions and governing structures in democracies around the world is declining, and trust is declining, political participation, in fact, is rising. I don't need to tell anyone here that in, in Hong Kong, but this rise globally is led by women and young people who are asking for more accountability more transparency, and a seat at the table, at least. So what we're seeing is not a principled rejection of democracy, but frustration over its absence or its flawed practice. It suggests that people around the world want more, or more precisely, better democracy, not less. Now, one reason for that is the track record for democracy is clear. It is no coincidence that the democratic era that has prevailed since the Cold War has concurrently been a period of unprecedented international peace in economic and social development worldwide, including right here in Asia. A vast majority of the world has benefited from an environment of democratic peace and succeeded as a result of the goodwill, open markets, and open societies of democratic nations. Academic studies are now proving con conclusively a connection between democracy and economic development, public health, and the quality of education. The reason Pretty simple, according to these studies. In a democracy, governments are accountable to the people. The system incentivizes them to be responsive to popular needs. And by contrast, history has shown that benevolent dictators are few. It's because for all their self-proclaimed efficiency, autocrats have little incentive to consider the broader public interest as they govern. They have every incentive instead to care first, if not only for political allies, and others who safeguard their power, leaving problems, including civilian grievances, unaddressed. It is an unfortunate fact of human nature that absent accountability, 
there will be abuse of power. Absent transparency and rule of law, there will be corruption. When power resides in a single individual, that individual will also receive the information he or she wants, rather than the truth they need to hear, leading to destructive and misguided policies that often cross borders. And when that happens, recourse to peaceful change is closed. Extreme options emerge. To paraphrase John F. Kennedy, a Democratic president, those who make peaceful change impossible will make violent action inevitable. That's what we've seen repeatedly around the world, not just in recent years or even decades, but over the centuries. In short, democracy, for all its faults, works. It is not only the right thing as a moral matter, but important to safeguard national peace and international security. It is this core belief that drives NDI's work worldwide, including here in Hong Kong. So, given recent events and that reputation that I mentioned earlier, I thought it appropriate to outline openly why NDI works in Hong Kong, whom we work with, and the work that we do. We began programming in Hong Kong in 1997, um, right after the handover. From 2004 to 2017, we maintained an office here. Our focus over the past 22 years has been consistent, to help support the citizens of the city to realize the full potential of democratic rights enshrined in the basic law, and promote continued international attention to the territory in the process. One focus of our attention was simply on information gathering and information sharing. For important reasons, the world focused most of its attention on the economic and political development of China, while focusing less on conditions here in Hong Kong, including progress toward realization of democratic principles enshrined in the basic law. Indeed, to address challenges, you must first identify them. So, since 1997, NDI has produced regular reports, 16 of them, through our Promise of Democratization in New York, in, New York, in Hong Kong series, to track the trajectory of political reform here. These reports gathered and analyzed the views of a broad, diverse group of stakeholders in Hong Kong, across the political spectrum, from academia and civil society, to political parties and the government, among others. And we then offer the resulting reports as resources to Hong Kongers and the international community alike. All of these reports are public. You can find them all going back to 1997 on our website, ndi.org. The next report will be out in early 2020. At the request of local partners, we have expanded efforts to empower Hong Kong citizens through research and training. NDI has recently supported a public opinion polling project with the University of Hong Kong to clearly capture citizen views of key democracy and livelihood challenges that they face. This initial poll, re re released in 2018, was a quantitative insight that anticipated many of the drivers of the current protest movement. We intended the poll to serve as a wake-up call to those who may not have understood what was happening within Hong Kong society and thus is the basis for constructive dialogue about a peaceful way forward in the territory. That poll is available on the University of Hong Kong website. The results of a second field poll will be released very soon. For two decades, NDI has worked with local civil society actors focused on rule of law and political reform to assist them to communicate more effectively, both with local and international audiences. Years ago, NDI conducted political party strengthening programs that included both pro-democracy and the so-called pro-Beijing parties. At one point, NDI sent small delegations to observe and report on conduct of Hong Kong's elections, as we have for elections in more than 100 places around the world over our history. Finally, through the years, the Institute has supported programs for women, youth, and minority political participation. We supported a youth peer debate program offered workshops to promote women's inclusion in politics and policy making, and brought technical experts on ethnic minority political participation to Hong Kong to share those practices. That's the work we've been doing here. In all cases, we have operated in a manner consistent with and in support of rights protected and democratic, process, uh, democratic promises outlined in the territory's basic law. We have not worked to support any political, political party or cause but rather to help promote resolution of Hong Kong's challenges through peaceful dialogue. Now, 
It is probably not news, again, to all of you, that Beijing has claimed that NDI, among others, has been involved in promoting Hong Kong independence or fomenting revolution or rebellion as a so-called black hand here. Let me say conclusively, this is patently false. I suspect many of those making those allegations know it is patently false. Let me say plainly, NDI is not and has not had a role, direct or indirect, in recent protests in Hong Kong or in any similar activities of the past. To suggest otherwise not only seeks to spread misinformation, but also fails to recognize the organic activity here, which stems from genuine grievances. If that wasn't clear to authorities before, it should be now, given the results of the district level elections two days ago. The danger is that continued failure to look sincerely at the current situation, in this case the real concerns of the Hong Kong people about the erosion of their rights, overall direction of this territory, will result in faulty policies and ultimately direct destructive solutions that are in no one's interest. I should note as well that NDI is a matter of principle decries use of violence by anyone to resolve political differences. While violence may seem to be an appealing option, given feelings of anger and frustration, NDI knows from three decades of experience that violence is counterproductive to achieving long-term political goals. Violent political movements are rarely successful, but only hardened attitudes, deepen divides, and fuel continued conflict. And democracy is not advanced in the process. Finally, in my view, the defining issue of our time is what the rules, the norms, and the values will be that guide nations and serve as a foundation of the international system in the 21st century. This issue of the values, the norms, and the rules that is being fought, that is being discussed on the streets, being fought for, to me is a defining issue of our time. For instance, will the world return to spheres of influence? Or will independent nations, large and small, have equal rights to protect their sovereign interests as they see fit? Will a country's majority population have the right to impose itself unconditionally on minorities? Or should minority populations have equal rights and protection? Should truth and free expression remain paramount values? Or must the world adjust its values and standards to accommodate other countries' feelings when the truth hurts? Does national security require an Orwellian surveillance system that watches your every move, purchase, and facial expression, and grants your rights according to an unaccountable government-imposed social credit score? Or will nations organize themselves under the assumption that true security will only come through a community of open societies and free peoples. Are human beings just masses ready to be manipulated by greater power? Or do they have inherent individual sovereignty and dignity? In the end, what is more important? The glory of the state or the dignity of the individual? The principle that people should have a say in how they are governed, that government should be accountable to its people, transparent in its actions, and inclusive of all citizens, these are basic values of human dignity. There are also values of democracy. These values are today under siege. But they always have and always will be. The fact is, history is never over. There are and will likely always be those interested in not only subverting democratic values at home, but find it in their interest to subvert them abroad, whether through disinformation, corruption, coercion, or other tools of malign influence. Thus, it is important that those who believe in principles of freedom and democracy stand together in solidarity across borders to promote and defend these values, to pr protect them and every turn peacefully against those who would attack or degrade them. So as the people of this city consider the way forward and work to make their voices heard, they should know that the same democratic spirit at work here is moving in other parts of the world. Hong Kong is a vanguard of a great global struggle in which millions of others are also engaged. It is a spirit that demands respect for basic values of free expression and for accountable, transparent, responsive, and representative governance that respects inherent human dignity. It is a spirit that transcends cultural or historical context to embrace basic human yearnings. Hong Kongers should also know that even as many of us watch from afar, you are not alone. That free people everywhere stand with you. We wish you nothing but success in having your voices heard in achieving your dreams despite the odds. It has been an honor to be in this place, 
at this time this afternoon in front of all of you. I thank you all for listening, and I look forward to the conversation that follows. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to start off by asking a, a few questions uh, to Vest Mitchell and then open, open it up to the floor for, for further discussion. Um, so you, you mentioned, you know, Berlin at the, at the, uh, the, um, during the, the, you know, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and, and sort of the, the, the turn of the century where we saw these, um, you know, these incredible optimism that, that democracy will, will prevail, right? And, um, you know, now, now we're in a situation that, that feels quite quite different. Um, how do you see Hong Kong in that context? A lot of people have made made the, the, the comparison of Hong Kong right now to Berlin in 1989, sort of standing between you know these two very very different values, right? What is being offered, obviously, by Beijing and by China, and, um, and, and you know the the Western ideals of, of, of democratic freedom and, and values. Um. Well, I addressed that a bit in the speech, but there are questions now whether, I mean, the Berlin Wall symbolized the Cold War and a fight, certainly for values, but a geopolitical conflict between countries and between, between systems and such. Um, I don't want Hong Kong, I, I would prefer, personally, as a, someone who observes uh, and been involved in U.S. policy, that, that we not get back to a Cold War type of framework um, in thinking about these things. But as I say, that there is a there are echoes of a similar fight that that you know I think transcends time will always be there between value systems um, and you're seeing the emergence coming from China coming from Russia coming from other liberal states in Turkey and Saudi and others who are promoting a different vision for how states should organize themselves um, and those values are up for grabs so the Berlin Wall did. Symbolize, it symbolizes one thing, which is a kind of division of geopolitical conflict, an ideological conflict. Um, I hope we can avoid that kind of uh, competition or that kind of uh, conflict. But the, um, the, the, the competition of values, um, I think is, there's an echo there. And Hong Kong represents that. As I say, Hong Kong, what's happening here, you'll see everywhere. I mean, I talked to a lot of the journalists including you, saying, well, we thought we were going to come here, we are going to focus on the rest of the region, this is a calm place, this is an oasis of stability. And you used to look around the world and you think, where is there an oasis of stability? There's ferment everywhere as people struggle with uh, their rights and struggle with this um, challenge of what is the right system, what will deliver for us. Um, and Hong Kong is part of that. So I hope it's not viewed as against anything. We want to avoid it being against anything, it's really for something. Uh, it shouldn't be zero sum. It should be something that, that the Hong Kong people do for themselves, uh, and that they feel uh, they are again people around the world that are in solidarity with them, and that those who have control here will see it as such that it's not aggression towards them, but an affirmation uh, of just basic rights. So, following on from that, it really seems that you know, in, in this region in particular, um, you know, what, what China, what Beijing is offering. Is something quite quite tempting to uh, authoritarian leaders, you know, across Southeast Asia, right? It is this this trade-off that we see, including in places like like Myanmar, that will give you investment, give you the money you need for infrastructure, without you know pressuring you on human rights, without pressuring you on um, you know uh, keeping up to, to the principles of democracy. In, in this sort of in, in this sort of reality, um, what do you think countries that, that care about democratic values and care about human rights and care about all these principles can, can do. I mean, what, what is the right approach? What's the right way to, you know, if we're not countering in that Cold War paradigm, you know, right. what is the right way to do? Well, countries will decide for themselves what they want. And what China's offering, if it's, it's infrastructure, if it's money, I mean, that's needed in, in underdeveloped societies. They need infrastructure. China has a lot of resources. There's nothing inherently wrong with China being more engaged in the world and constructively contributing to international stability or development in places where others can't go. American, America may not have the resources, the West may not. So inherently there's nothing wrong. It's what they bring with it, again, the values they bring with it, or whether they are truly investing in these countries. But the attitude is really extraction. They're there to extract rather than truly invest. 
Um, are they doing things transparently? Again, it gets to the rules and values and norms. Are they providing assistance in a way that contributes to the well-being of people? That it's, it's done on the open. It's not done with corruption, intending actual corruption, paying people off, uh, engaging countries in debt traps, uh, doing things transparently. Uh, what can we do to to help countries resist that? I think one of the things is, is um, uh, maybe uh, help share knowledge about how China is operating around the world. Um, I think these countries are learning for themselves pretty quickly how China operates, but the more that we can assist that process of understanding how China finds ways to um, uh, shaping media and uh, shaping the facts on the ground towards their interests. Um, I think empowering civil society, empowering democratic practice, you're not just dealing with the leaderships, but ensuring there's accountability from below. Um, that is, I think we can we can help uh, with programming along those lines. Uh, but standing by these countries in you know, recognition and not complicating their lives. I think sometimes it can be viewed that we're lecturing countries, watch out for China, watch out for China. Uh, and that can be counterproductive. Countries understand their interests. And we don't want to make it, again, a geopolitical conflict. Um, but fortify these countries with the knowledge and the tools to push back themselves and affirm their own sovereignty. That I think we can do, um, and I think we uh, we work to our benefit in that process. Well, that's one question of Jody Schneider, the president of the club. Um, what would you you congratulated Hong Kong and thank you very much uh, <laughs> uh, for the vote this weekend? Um, what, you didn't vote, did you? No, I don't. No, I'm still preparing. Thank you. I'm not a permanent resident. Um, but um, what? Would you like that vote to really, what does, should that victory mean? What would you like to see happen now that, um, you know, 71% of the people voted, uh, 3 million people, and 85% of the uh, district council um, seats went to pro-democratic candidates? What should that mean? Well, as I say, I think the voice and the message was loud and clear um, that a moderate middle said, we, we want change. Um, and um, we're not going away. I mean, this was a referendum. This wasn't a local election per se. This was framed as a referendum on, on reform. Uh, and China and you know, the Hong Kong government will have a hard time saying, well, there's a silent majority that doesn't believe uh, in what the people in the streets are doing. Um, but I think it's an opportunity. It's, a, it's an opportunity now. It's always better, of course. This is the, the theory of democracy. It's the beauty of democracy. It's always better to fight at the ballot box than to fight in the streets. And here you have an opportunity where there was a contest at the ballot box. Um, and um, the, the voice of the people was loud and clear. The question is, is the government not going to take that opportunity and run with it and say, OK, now we have to reflect and answer the needs and be responsive. Some of the initial commentary from the government, at least what I saw in the media, was encouraging, of course, the credit and proof of will be in their actions. But I hope that both all sides to go take a breath. Uh, it does seem that, that, you know, as I say, violence on all sides is not preferable. Um, maybe we can get to a point of a stable um, a situation where the government, the ball is certainly in the government's court, to take a step forward uh, and say we, we've heard. Now let's talk about a way forward to so that we don't go back to um, the unstable and violent conditions of the past. Now, I hope that's, that opportunity is seized. And if that opportunity is not seized, or done inadequately, the people will speak again. Uh, and it, it leads to, a, I think, a dead end for the territory. Um, so really, the ball is in the court of the government here, and authorities in Beijing to the degree that they will have influence on the decision. Um, but I, I, you know, I think on all sides, it's incumbent on them to figure out what they could do to contribute to building again trust, uh, coming together in good faith, and answering the challenges that are faced by everybody here. Uh, so I'll just ask one more question uh, before I open up the floor to the floor. Uh, not to keep bringing it back to our old haunt, Myanmar, but you know sometimes sometimes you you have uh, democratic progress, but you get something you know quite ugly, right? In in the case of of Myanmar, it was a lot of support for for a campaign that essentially saw the expulsion of a of, of a you know 
was a minority, right? Um, what, what, what do you do in, in those sorts of situations when, when, when the will of the people is actually something that is quite, quite, quite ugly and, and quite dangerous? That's, uh, that's a huge challenge, including in illiberal countries where you get frustrated at the leadership that are chipping away, like in the Philippines or in Hungary, they're chipping away systematically at uh, independent judiciary and free media and all the liberties. Uh, you know. So they talk about illiberal democracy. Well, illiberal democracy is not democracy. But uh, as I say, that's more democracy informed in fact. But people choose, actually choose an illiberal result or support that kind of intolerance in society. Um, it's painful to, to watch. It is, um, you know, there's no generic way of dealing with it. Um, in the case of the Rohingya, um, the first thing you do is you have to give voice, you have to stay true to those suffering people. Um, there's just no other ways about it. And make sure we don't forget. Um, try to find a way for them to get justice and, and that they get some kind of humanity in that awful, awful situation. That's number one. So everything you do has to be with that mind. How do we, we are where we are, let's try and address that situation. But there's a struggle I know in the United States, in the US Congress, well, then what do we do about the rest of Myanmar? We were supporting democracy. Um, that's still a work in progress. And now we've seen this violence. Do we then just isolate the country like we did back in the days when there were sanctions and there was a military junta in charge? And I think there is now a divide where the belief is, no, we have to stay committed to the democratic development of Recognize this is a country that is underdeveloped, that is not worldly, it is, it is struggling very much um, because 50 years of isolation in essence. Uh, we have to assist them in going forward, um, but we have to give voice to the, to the, to the devastation that, that occurred and make sure it doesn't go unremarked. But don't, but continue to, I think, invest in the, in the future of that country. Um, other women, other <coughs> There's no easy answer to, um, to to those questions. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah. So, any any questions? Uh, just raise your hand. Uh, someone will bring you a mic. I think. Yeah. And yeah, please identify yourself uh, for asking a question and uh, keep it to a question, not a statement. Hi, uh, Keith Richberg, uh, former president of the club here, and now teaching journalism at HKU. I just want to know if you could talk a little bit. One thing we've seen over the last 30 years is even dictators now have elections. Yes. Putin, you know, Turkey, Cambodia right. is having right. one, uh, you know, Thailand. How do you deal with this issue that now, you know, autocrats are seeing that they can legitimize themselves by having an election? The election day itself might actually be relatively free and fair, right. but all the vote bringing and everything else happens right. beforehand. How do we as journalists deal with that? How should the public view these kind of what I call sham elections. Right. And as you said, they validate themselves. <laughs> no one else is being validated. In NDI, I should just add, the way we do work, it's not like we parachute in on election day. We look around and see how things are and parachute out. That's why we have more than 50 offices around the world. Um, and we've been involved in more than 100 elections. We've been doing uh, election observation, bringing in international delegations, uh, but also working with civil society in countries to develop their capacity to monitor the conditions, and that means during the pre-election phase, in the very earliest stage between elections, how is the media environment, are folks able to campaign effectively, are political parties being treated equally, uh, right through the election period, the vote count, and then the transfer of power and beyond. And the, the comments that we make, the observations we make, are based on an entire electoral process. So we are not going to go and observe an election in Turkey in those situations. Well, we'll just say Russia or if Turkey is, you know, bringing, or other places, or Cambodia. In fact, we were kicked out of Cambodia. And I figured that would be, it's sort of a red flag that when well, you're truly interested in, in objective um, observers of what you're doing, or do you want it to be a self validation exercise? So we don't, we don't say elections are democracy. NDI is about a process, about a full a number of institutions and a culture um, of democracy. And so we don't give credence. That. And I think as journalists, you have to look at that as well. Um, but what's interesting as well is they feel they have to go through the process, a quasi, even if it's a sham democratic process. And that's what's interesting today. Even as you see regression of democracy, you're also seeing the resilience of democracy now. Because even as things seem to regress, 
countries still have to allow for some voices. They allow for the elections. They have to have a veneer where they're giving people an ability to speak. So as I mentioned, in places like Poland, in Hungary, uh, in Turkey, they had municipal elections, and people spoke in droves and said, we don't like where the country's going. So they thought they were controlling the environment. But in fact, these countries are forced to have to uh, provide a little bit of an opening, a little bit of a voice, and people are speaking, even in those conditions. And they're not, and they're assuming, they're expecting that their voices be heard. That's what we're seeing with people coming to the streets. The processes aren't working, they may be shutting down, but the expectation is there, more so than 30 years. So progress has been made. It's just that democracy is difficult. And, and you're seeing, I think, the resilience now, and the people saying, we don't like the way it's gone. We don't like sham elections. We don't like the democracy has been weak. The institutions are too weak. Corruption continues. The same old guys are in charge, playing the same games. We want something different. And that's the hope of democracy, that there'll be another round of uh, affirmative action. You were on my committee, right, when I had to defend uh, my, my, my malt on <laughs> yeah, 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 So, yeah, so, that's, so uh, I thought I'd throw a tough one at you. Yeah. Uh, I'm David's wife, um, uh, retired from HP uh, USD. Um, so you work for an organization uh, that, uh, an American organization that pushes democracy. How do you, I mean, how do you respond to my you know, late 1960s leftist uh, view that says, what right do you have to, to do this? I mean, you're the guy who brought us Vietnam, right? And here in this area, this room, you can walk around here. You've got all kinds of pictures of the war in Vietnam. You're the guys who brought the CIA and torture to Latin America. We've all seen the movies. Um, and I think that to a certain extent, in Asia, you get dismissed, or that argument will be dismissed by Chinese who are, you know, decent businessmen here, and they'll just say, you know, it's our part of the world. Uh, what right do you have? Mm -hmm. And particularly given the context of your president, and I'm Canadian, so he's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knew you were the Canadian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, my consul general is here, so I had, to, I had to do something about that. But given you're an honorary the, American dude, so <laughs> I gave back my green card. I didn't want to pay taxes. Um, so, so uh, yeah, how do you respond to to that? You know, like what right do you have to go around and do this? Right. Well, it's also the way we talk about this. As I mentioned, we support democracy. We're not pushing democracy. We support those who are making a decision that they would like, uh, usually in many places in transition, they would like assistance with the development of the institutions and processes that go into democracy. So we don't push ourselves in. We go where we are welcome, uh, where there is a, where folks have asked for our help. Um, we are based in Washington, D.C. As I mentioned, 80% of our funding comes from the U.S. government. But our programs, as I mentioned, that's why I listed NDI's network and the way we do our work. We have 55 plus offices, about 55 offices or so, around the world. I, I did a count, 85% or so of them are led by non-Americans. And, and that's in, not including those in those offices who are from other countries. We are sharing democratic experiences. We are not promoting the American model. We go out there and say, we offer you help, just like any other development, agent, a development NGO, in essence, and say, we are offering political assistance, political development. And you have, we look at context, and we say, OK, you have these challenges. We can bring things to bear that help you with your challenge. As I mentioned, when it comes to Hong Kong, ways that we can bring, you know, build capacity, affirm uh, people's ability here to defend their rights under the basic law, or talk to political parties about their development equally across the board, without favor. So we know that everywhere we go, um, there's going to be these questions about us. I worked 20 years ago, you know, is this the CIA? Are they going to come in here and do, you know, and we have to prove ourselves every place we go that we're here to deliver for you. We're in service with you. We are partners with you to help because we believe, as I outlined in my talk, that democracy works. And it's not just working within countries. It works for international stability. It works for everybody. Uh, and we do, as Americans. I mean, there is that, and I, we're seeing all around the world, that deep down people believe that individuals, every individual, whether you're American or even Canada, even Canadians, deserve dignity. Uh, uh, so, so, and you know, you can't get Americans to say this very often. 
you yeah. do. We'll say about all going on a limb. Because you get a funding from a Canadian. So you can't keep your own. Yeah, you can't keep your own. So but this is why should it be simply an American thing? So we shouldn't hold ourselves back because we're American. Um, even though American policy does things that are, you know, that we don't approve of, or you know, maybe things that you don't approve of. Um, we're offering a service. And, and that's how we view it. We view it as a as a as a service. I think it was me. My name is Paul Zimmerman. I'm an elected councillor here in Hong Kong. Um, you, you said just before that you are help where you are welcome. Uh, but I believe that China has made clear you're not welcome here. Yeah. Um, so you continue to help. So I, I just hope maybe you want to clarify that because you just said you help where you're welcome. Um, and uh, you will assist all parties, and maybe right now the DAB in Hong Kong needs your help. Uh, so I'm sure they're going to they've invited you. Uh, but uh, laughs aside, uh, Hong Kong is very specific. You just mentioned the kind of work you do in Hong Kong. But maybe to be very specific, how much money are you spending here uh, directly and indirectly on Hong Kong? I think for the media that is recording this, it's probably good to be specific because the Chinese media has said of all various amounts of money you're spending here. And then uh, finally, my, my question is, um, the specific, are you involved in developing, to help him develop specific proposals? Uh, the next day, council elections coming up, uh, the chief executive elections coming up. Those are the real discussions we're having, how to take them forward. Are you putting intelligence into that process of debate? Um, I'm trying to remember all the questions. On the last one, no. We don't get involved in that. Putting together specific proposals, we're not involved in policy outcomes, we're about the process. We're bringing people together so they can talk together to determine what the Hong Kong people uh, would like uh, in that process. Um, the amount of money, I'll have to find out exactly how much. We don't spend money here. I mean, that's not, we're not around passing money out. I mean, it's about supporting, doing programs here and supporting those. But we can find out how much altogether um, is spent on Hong Kong programming. It's not much. Is it? What I listed there is everything we've done for the past 22 years. I mean, not consistently, some of which we did 22 years ago, some of which we did 20 years ago. I mean, right now, there's, uh, you know, it's quite limited. So, um, but I give you a sense of the things we have been doing. Um, China welcoming us here, well, we'll ask the Hong Kong people what they want. If China decides to the Hong Kong government that you can't work here, and we will, you know, we'll, for whatever, kick you out or whatever, well, then we'll have to take that into consideration. But we had an office here until 2017. We're not hiding. Uh, we're transparent. We're working with folks, and you know I laid out what we do. Um, so, and again, it's a, it's a constructive process. Um, and until you know they can say we don't want the I to be here, uh, but again, I think you know, under the basic law, it should be legal. Uh, that's the high degree of autonomy I would hope would allow for the type of work that we do in the interests of the people here. Um, and then, was there another question? That's, 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 that's essentially it. Uh, just take one, actually two more. We'll take one from the back and, and one from the back. Hi, I'm, I'm Nick Gord. I'm a writer for a, for a think tank here. Today's wave of global discontent seems to be motivated, at least in part, by concerns around economic justice, inequality, social mobility, other claims of that nature. Even here, the calls for democracy are motivated, again in part, by a wish for a fairer, less oligarchic economic system. First of all, how should democracies advance or development, start dealing with these claims of economic justice and more? And more specifically, has NDI changed its approach or its program to deal with these new claims? Um, no, I mean, not specifically on that issue of economic justice, I suppose. Though we, I mean, look, the political process provides um, a road towards economic justice. If you have a system that politically gives an advantage to business interests or those who are supporting business interests, then you're going to get results that support business interests. You get an oligarchic result and, and economic justice flows or injustice can flow from that. So yes, and, and so in terms of our assistance of a process for providing more openness for our political contestation or political um, discussion um, to potentially change that system, which is more than demand, certainly here, or 
you know, to fulfill the promises of the basic law, then yes, that can get to issues of economic justice. But uh, again, we're not promoting certain proposals or certain vision ourselves. And we're about pro process, not outcomes, and allowing people here to decide how, uh, how to pursue their own Thanks, John. Making change from Hong Kong here. I'd like to sort of build on what both uh, Keith and David asked you. So, if we take the start point that all electoral systems are imperfect, I guess the question is when you talk about you're offering people different models, how far down that spectrum do you accept as a reasonable model? And I think that the specific version of David's question is given that the American system has its own very specific flaws, right? Doesn't it seem that's the part that worries me is that you're telling other people how to improve their systems if you're not recognizing the weaknesses in your own? Right. Um, I'll just answer that part of it. When I was ambassador, I, I emphasized the weaknesses of my own system. <laughs> and I think that humility is in order. And the fact that democracy is hard and that you have to fight for it every generation, which I said when I was in Myanmar, when I was in Burma, became true in my own country a year, a year and a half later. That you have to you have to struggle for this, that it's not something that is just um, inevitable or going to um, sustain itself on its own. So in fact, you can teach lessons from our experience of what works and what doesn't, and be humble about sharing them. Um, you know, we're not asking folks to say, to do democracy or be democratic because America is. That's not our message. Our message is, as I say, the opposite. This is hard. It's the best system compared to all the other, worst system except all the others. That was Winston Churchill's line. Democracy's worst form of government ever created, except all the others. Well, countries are choosing for themselves um, to go down that path. And we're not judging them. We're not sitting back and writing reports of, you're on this part of the spectrum, and shame on you. No, we're, we're going every day and saying, how can we help you? How can we help you do better? How can we, and we judge whether there's sincerity or not in the government um, as to what we do inside the country. But if there's space to do it, and we can do that, and we can bring experiences, and we can help demonstrate our, you know, our solidarity and our support, why not? Why not do that? Um, and if it, you know, being American now, you've got, you know, you've got, people will say, I mean, usually that's the first question I get, how can you do this when you have what you have in Washington right now? But go around the world, it's remarkable. Our folks were in Ukraine uh, about a week ago, two weeks ago. Not one of our partners mentioned impeachment. Not one of our partners out there said, oh, what's going on with you in Washington? They're focused on themselves. They've got enough challenges of themselves, and, if, and they're saying, can you help us or can you not help us? Are these things you can do for us or not? And then I, I think it matters. American leadership no doubt matters when it comes to this stuff. It's a headwind to the work that we do. But that doesn't mean we stop doing it. Um, and people are not doing it because of us. Um, they're doing it because of themselves. And what we do is try to support what they want. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, and thank you for uh, thank you to Ambassador Mitchell for, for being here. Um,
number of 30 is wrong. It's bullshit. It's like 200. But they're hiding in different places. And they're, they're hoping they can stay there until the campus reopens. There's at least 20 HKU. Uh, I am in a bit. I've got to do a couple of okay. layers. I'll see, see you later. Good question. <laughs>